Good afternoon. My name is Lise Grande, and I'm the president of the U.S. Institute of Peace, which was established by the U.S. Congress in 1984 as a nonpartisan public institution dedicated to helping prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict abroad. USIP is honored to be one of the co-hosts of today's launch of the U.S.-Afghan Consultative Mechanism. During the years since the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan last August, we've seen the Taliban government systematically strip away the rights and the protection for women, girls, and vulnerable people across Afghanistan. In every way, this is terrible, unacceptable behavior by state authorities, and something that requires determined joint action. This is why the U.S. Department of State, in partnership with the Atlantic Council, the Institute for Women, Peace, and Security at Georgetown University, the Sisterhood is Global Institute, and USIP, are establishing this new U.S. Afghan consultative mechanism. The aim of the mechanism is to support the fight to protect the rights of Afghans by providing international platforms for Afghan women, by tracking human rights violations, and by identifying ways the U.S. and the international community can support a more inclusive and peaceful Afghanistan. It is a privilege to be joined today for this launch by the U.S. Special Envoy for Afghan Women, Girls, and Human Rights, Rina Miri who will be moderating today's presentation and discussion. Rena has over two decades of experience advising and working with governments in Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and Europe. Rena served as a senior advisor to the U.S. Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan during the Obama administration, and she has held a number of positions with the United Nations including as a senior mediation expert, one of the most prestigious positions in the U.S., and in the office of the U.N. Special Representative of the Secretary General in Afghanistan. Rena has also held senior positions at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, at Princeton University, and at the Center on International Cooperation at New York University. Rena, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much, Lise, and uh, thank you to, the, uh, to uh, USIP for opening up their beautiful space to us and for just being such a solid partner, both to the U.S. government and to Afghans for decades now. Uh, I couldn't think of a, a better place to launch this, this initiative. Um, I also want to thank the audience. I, I see uh, among you Afghan women leaders um, that it makes me very happy to see just the, the unsung heroes that have been working tirelessly for Afghanistan for decades. I also see many colleagues from the, the State Department and across the U.S. government who have been working tirelessly on Afghanistan. The last two decades of what has been achieved in Afghanistan has been through the people, I think you all illustrate the, the, the vitality, the spirit, the commitment that was there that enabled the successes that we saw in, the, in those two decades. And it is, uh, you know, what has been encouraging for me is I have heard from those voices over and over again um, before I took this position and since then that it's not going to be a question of if, but how to support the Afghan people. And I think ultimately that's what we need. We need uh, to not look at this in terms of the, the, the tremendous challenges of today, but the short term, the immediate term, and the long term. My perspective is one of a, of a, a realist but optimist, and I think that's the only way to look at the situation in Afghanistan. Pessimism and walking away is not a choice that any of us have, um, not only from a moral imperative, uh, but also from a, a strategic uh, uh, imperative. You know, the U.S. 
uh, engaged in Afghanistan uh, in 2001, not just from a, uh, from a position of principle, but because the situation in Afghanistan was one that was going to be, uh, was a menace and a threat to the region and to the, to the US, to the international community. That situation is not different today. And the work that we are doing, the, uh, uh, the engagements that we aspire towards, is all designed to address the moral imperative and the strategic imperative. I am honored um, to be on the stage with these, the women that you see uh, with us today. They, again, are one, are, there are three people right now. There's a fourth uh, representative that is here with us but she did, uh, did not want um, to be on screen because of security threats that she will unlikely face. She's in Afghanistan. I, um, I want to start perhaps by uh, talking about, um, first, I should actually thank my, my, our partners, the Atlantic Council, the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, uh, and the Sisterhood is Global Institute in, in addition to USIP. Um, and then I, I want to perhaps begin by introducing the voice that we have from Afghanistan, and then I'm going to introduce the, the um, exceptional women we have on stage. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we are aiming to do with this consultative mechanism. Um, the woman that, I, that is with us from Afghanistan, she's an activist. She is a woman of tremendous courage. Um, I am not gonna use her real name. I'm gonna use uh, a pseudonym, Mariam which is a very common name in Afghanistan. She says, with so much media coverage and a complete shutdown of civil society and freedom of expression, many of you will not know what is happening in Afghanistan. The Taliban have issued 29 verdicts and decrees to eliminate women's rights and freedom of speech but the wholesale and public attack on women and the values of humanity is not something that is simply an Afghan problem. It is a threat to global rights and values. Communities have been working at the local level and know better than anyone what their needs are. It is more important now than ever that the international community continue to work with the Afghan people in our struggles for dignity, human rights, and freedom. I um, will inject some of her uh, thoughts throughout this, uh, um, this discussion. She has also written a letter to um, Secretary Blinken, who I hope is going to be with us later today. He is deeply committed to uh, the situation in Afghanistan and women's rights. I think the fact that he created my office is a testament to that. But I've also been incredibly grateful with the level of support that I have received from him consistently in the last eight months since I've taken my position. And uh, he has indicated that this, is, uh, this initiative is a priority for him, and he's going to work very hard to get here, um, uh, hopefully by the end of our session. Um, let me begin by introducing um, our luminary panelists. Um, Ms. Palwasha Hassan, uh, at the very end, is a senior fellow at the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, where she chairs the Afghan Women's Policy Collective. She is dedicated, a dedicated women's rights activist, pioneering many critical works to promote women's rights in civil society in Afghanistan. She has been working for decades on the issue of Afghan women, uh, and there seems to be nothing that, that uh, uh, she is willing to sacrifice, uh, not willing to sacrifice in order to fight for the rights of Afghan women. And uh, I first met Palwa Shajan, I think over two decades ago, when I went and visited her in, in Pakistan. Uh, we have Ms. Asila Wardak um, in the center. Uh, she is uh, uh, the 2022-23 Robert and uh, Jarnos Scholar Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. She is an Afghan uh, woman leader 
uh, activist and former diplomat. She has uh, played many different roles um, in the Af uh, Afghan government, the previous uh, regime, and, uh, and, it, and was, again, both a champion inside the government and outside and continues to play that role. Um, our final panelist is Ms. Nahid Sarabi. She's a visiting fellow at the Center for Sustainable Development uh, uh, within the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institute. And she has over 10 years of experience in development, policy, and planning. And she was also in the former uh, government. Uh, each one of these women uh, brings just, I think, uh, what is uh, very exceptional about their, their work is that they have been able to bring their level of expertise inside the government, outside the government. They've worked with the international community. And so they have the, the advantage of having looked at this issue from many different lenses and will bring that expertise into the discussion. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how we are seeing this launch and where it comes from. Since I started my position on January 7th, we've had over 100 consultations with Afghan women, civil society, and at-risk groups. And, uh, you know, this uh, is a deliverable, in some respects, from those conversations. What I, had, I heard from uh, the women and men that I spoke to is that they were seeking um, a place and if a, a platform to bring their voices together, particularly Afghan women, who say they are scattered all over the world now. They are experts. Um, they are inside Afghanistan and outside Afghanistan. They are engaged inside and outside the country. Um, they have they lost their platform in Afghanistan, but they haven't lost the drive to continue being a leading voice for Afghan women and men. They have told us, do not just speak to the Taliban. The Taliban do not represent our voices. Do not listen to the Taliban when they tell you that this is Afghan culture. Because to understand Afghan culture, you need to talk to the myriad of voices inside Afghanistan, which is one of the most diverse countries in the world. They have said, avoid repeating the mistakes of the past. Bring us in at the outset engage us, learn from our lessons from the past, and turn to our expertise, because right now, more than any other time, we need out-of-the-box thinking in terms of how we move forward, and we need those lessons from those that have the knowledge and the expertise from inside the country. Let this be a two-way exchange, not just a, a, a dynamic where we come and we sit with policymakers, and they nod sympathetically, and then that ends the conversation. We want something that's systematic, we want something that's ongoing, and we want something that brings together the policymaking community in the US and the, the Af Afghans who are both the stakeholders, but also the experts. And that's what we're striving to do. We're tr striving to put something together that is going to meet those needs and that is going to reflect a more systematic way of engaging non-Talib Afghans. I, I, I don't like to use that term, but I think that that is something that they have said to us, is that the, the distinction, you know, the Taliban right now are getting a big audience in the international community, despite the fact that there's enormous misgivings um, with that, and I think, quite frankly, a bit of uh, frustration these days um, in engaging them. But there is uh, the recognition that there's a necessity to engage them to address the situation inside the country for the 40 million Afghans. But there's also a need to, to, to reflect a more systematic process of engaging Afghans that reflect the diversity of uh, the country um, so that they don't they don't present a monopoly in terms of the voice of Afghan people. Uh, the, uh, we, so why start with, uh, with partner organizations rather than doing something on our own? This is something also that uh, we are building on the feedback that we've received where they said, don't, um, don't start from zero. There's a lot of expertise out there. There is a lot of work out there. Um, and it's quite frankly, I think, in the US government, we know how hard it is to start something that, that is um, this am ambitious, I think, in terms of the reach that we want. And um, so we are building on the platforms that have been engaging Afghans for 
uh, decades. Uh, those that that know Afghans, that Afghans have had established relations, but also those that actually know the U.S. government and the international community. USIP, Atlanta Council, Georgetown's Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, they are regularly engaging uh, with, uh, uh, with Afghans and with the U.S. government. And the, uh, the sisterhood uh, is global. The, and the New York-based uh, entity that we're working with, they are um, uh, working very closely with the U.N. and have also pulled together a group of experts. This is where we're starting with, but it's a uh it's, uh, I'd like to think of it as, a, uh, as uh, being at the pilot level right now. It's an iterative process, so it's not to say that we're just going to be working with these four partners, but we, as we learn how to do this, as we learn what works, what doesn't work, we're going to apply those lessons with our partners and most importantly with Afghan voices to identify um, how we can broaden the engagement with, uh, with other organizations. Um, and uh, in terms of the, the composition of, of who is going to be part of this mechanism, it will be a diverse group of Afghans from both inside and outside the country to foster deeper, more systematic discussions with the US government. They will include both standing members as well as a regular flow of new voices because we want the standing voices to have that to deepen the discussion, but we also want to bring in new voices so that we don't have the, sometimes you, you become quite staid. And we also want to make sure that it, uh, that, that inclusivity is brought in by, have, by being able to constantly bring in the, the new voices. Um, we, it's going to be largely Afghan, but we will also have internationals as experts and as resource people. And in terms of the, the composition of men versus women, it's going to be two-thirds women, or something along these lines, one-third men. We are leaning heavily into bringing women because, quite frankly, the situation is, uh, uh, is uh, the most dire for women. And also, whenever we have these type of initiatives, we, bring in, we sprinkle in women, and it's largely men. We're going to do this a bit differently this time. Uh, in terms of issues and themes that will emerge from the discussions and the work, it's going to be uh, emerging from the discussions that the members are going to have with the U.S. government. Um, but it's not just going to center on, on what, is, what tends to happen when there's engagements with women, where we talk about women's rights and then we don't engage them on other issues. We're going to make sure that, um, that the, the discussions are ones that respond to the situation on the ground, to the challenges that need to be met. It's going to be everything from looking at uh, human rights mechanisms and accountability and how that can be better fostered to uh, other er areas of rule of law, to inclusive processes for, uh, to bring women in civil society and to, uh, and to an inclusive peace process. Uh, hopefully um, that, that is something that will emerge um, uh, in, I'm hoping, in the near future. But at some point, I think there will be entry point for that. And we need to make sure that we are well equipped to, to be able to engage meaningfully on that, uh, uh, on that issue. Um, so I, I'm taking much more time than I wanted to in terms of, of uh, talking, but I just have two more points. So the division of labor is going to be that, the, that these partner organizations that already have groups of Afghans that they're working with, they are going to be responsible for, the, um, for bringing uh, uh, the, the voices together, identifying what the thematic issues are. The, our office, my office, is um, going to be engaging the U.S. government, and, and I shouldn't say it's just my office. What I'm hoping is that the U.S. government ac across the board is going to be engaging this platform and uh, both to come, uh, what I'm hoping, the conversation that I'm hoping is going to happen is they're going to say, you know, we are trying to figure out how to get funding to women-led organizations. How can we do that better? Let's go to talk to the experts at, at, the, at the consultative mechanism. Or the women um, know that, well, this is an issue we really want to learn more about in terms of how the US government is approaching the issue of um, shelters. Let's go and have a conversation with them. Let's see what they're doing. And let's see how we can do this better. And. Um, you know, this is the way we're looking at it. I, I, um, but as I said, it's just the very beginning. The way that it's going to develop is going to be dependent on uh, 
um, how the members see it, how the organizations uh, identify uh, the, the, the path and the process to move forward. And, um, and finally, we are keen to link with other platforms. Right now, one of the positive um, uh, trends have been that there are countries um, and different, uh, particularly in Europe, there's the EU, there's Spain, um, there's the UK that are putting together platforms to bring together women leaders and civil society. We want to link up with them so that women, uh, Afghan women and men are not having separate conversations, repetitive conversations, but to really bring these, uh, these discussions together and to work together strategically. Now, without further ado, I'm going to turn to our speakers, and we're going to have um, a, uh, I'm going to take the prerogative of the moderator and ask them a few questions. Then I'm going to turn to you. We also have some questions that uh, were given to us online. And then hopefully, at that point, the secretary will come and address the group. We will then um, end the, the uh this part of the discussion, and uh, we will meet you again in reception after they have a few minutes with the secretary. I finally want to just say, before I forget, I want to thank my fabulous team who has been working around the clock to make this and so much else happen. Thank you. Can you hear me? OK. So the qu first question, I see Lajan. I know you don't want me to ask you the first question, so I'll start with Palwa Shajan. Um, despite multiple commitments by the Taliban on education, secondary, sc uh, secondary school doors remain closed to Afghan girls. If you could sit down with the Taliban today, how would you approach this? I'll, and, and let's just think beyond the Taliban. What else can be done? when the Taliban have been so uh, uh, un unable and unwilling to deliver on the issue of girls' education, particularly at the secondary level. Uh, hello, is this OK? Um, thank you, Rina John. And now, first of all, congratulations for establishing this platform, which is reduces the gap uh, which civil society in Afghanistan has always been complaining about. And we are now in direct contact uh, with US policymakers. Uh, regarding this question, um, uh, one of the things I would uh, recommend is that the US should strongly engage Islamic countries, as they can uh, effectively demonstrate uh, the compatibility of girls' schooling uh, within Islam or uh, uh, in Islamic countries. Unfortunately, Afghanistan is one country um, where girls are not allowed to study beyond a primary level. Uh, that is the only country it is. And it is an alarming um, uh, uh, factor, f not only for women in Afghanistan, um, but internationally, and especially in Islamic country, because this is setting a very wrong precedence and example. Uh, so for that reason, it's important uh, that uh, they be part of the efforts to make that change possible in Afghanistan. I also uh, see uh, that the US and international community should um, pursue uh, parallel um, efforts. Um, on one hand, uh, there should be um, lev the leverage should be applied um, uh, so that enough pressure is created and Taliban reopen schools for girls in Afghanistan. But on another hand, we cannot afford uh, to lose more uh, education time for Afghan girls. And uh, it's important that we have alternative for girls in Afghanistan uh, and that they can benefit from, uh, uh, they, are, they are not left behind and they can benefit from the education to go on. And I think in this uh, very much, it's important uh, to note the 
a critical role uh, that Afghan civil society and especially NGO sectors and women groups are playing in education in Afghanistan uh, in the last 20 years, uh, year, uh, years, but also beyond that. In uh, the years of conflict, uh, there has been several initiatives, including home schools, uh, there have been peer learning education, there have been uh, trends of um, online education which is starting, scholarship, so many other alternatives. These are very much important to be supported, and but they should not be considered as substitute for uh, education sector in Afghanistan or formal education. So there should be continuous efforts on reopening schools, but in meanwhile, uh, there should be uh, this uh, support to all uh, the other roles that civil society uh, in Afghanistan is playing. Um, one other thing which is important uh, that um, or maybe in conclusion, I would like to say that Afghanistan is the one country that we cannot afford uh, that uh, our next generation be not be educated or ill-educated. Uh, our youth, especially our girls, need to be part of the future stability and peace in Afghanistan. And that can only be done if they are educated. Thank you, Pablo Shajan. Uh, Asila Jan, um, in the course of your career, as, uh, both in civil society and as a government official, you've had many opportunities to engage with the U.S. government. What are your hopes for how this consultative mechanism can effectively engage Afghan women in civil society, particularly at this critical juncture? And what can it do differently to maximize values on all sides? Um, uh, thank you, Rina Jan. Um, Good afternoon to everybody. I'm so glad that uh, seeing um, so many friends, uh, like from past years, I couldn't make time to, to see friends, but I'm, I'm so happy that uh, I can find myself among all these wonderful people. Um, Rina Jan, as you, you are aware um, about uh, the women's movement in Afghanistan and also civil society organization, they were very much active and then they played a great role in the past 20 years or more than uh, 20 years, especially women's movement in Afghanistan. Uh, and. Um, we were sort of uh, involved, like informal, we had informal discussion in the past months with Your Excellency, with um, Excellency Tom West on different occasions uh, and uh, uh, through Afghan Women Network Platform, through Afghan Coalition for Changes, through uh, Women for, uh, um, Forum for Afghanistan, through different platforms we had informal uh, discussion. But I'm so glad I welcome this initiative that at least now it's shaping all these informal discussions to, uh, um, to a formal discussion and it shows that the commitment of uh, U.S. government. Uh, of course, no one can deny that um, the uh, beauty of Afghanistan is the, the diversity. Uh, it's, so we cannot deny that um, we do have multi-ethnicities, we do have multi-language in, in Afghanistan, and everything should be inclusive. Not only civil society or women should uh, be uh, consulted, but uh, minority groups, marginalized people, uh, women group, youth group uh, should be part of all these uh, consultative me uh, mechanisms. And I would like to also request U.S. government that at least gave us uh, some space, some open space to discuss, uh, to be a voice for voiceless uh, women. Uh, um, as Palwasha said, that uh, CSSO, we, we, we had so many organizations, media, women's group in Afghanistan, but some of them, they were closed by Taliban, and some, uh, they were not active because of the, the funding issues. Some, they left the country. But we really would like, especially in terms of women organization, we would like to be kind of bridge between the um, between um, uh, women inside Afghanistan and then uh, women diaspora and then exile. I, I, can, I cannot uh, count myself as a woman in diaspora, but I'm exile. I'm forced to, to leave my country. So I really would like to be a kind of bridge and then uh, it's very much important to uh, to include everybody to this uh, mechanism and I, I hope that US government also um, uh, start this this to, 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 to bridge this this gap. Thank you. Thank you Asila Jan. Anoy Jan, uh, one of the areas that uh, that inclusion is going to be absolutely essential is on economic recovery. You previously served as the Deputy Minister of Finance in Afghanistan. Could you please speak to women's contributions to the Afghan economy and the short term and the long term and the impact of what we're seeing today, women's uh, almost entire exclusion from, the econ from economic activities? Thank you so much, Rina Jan. Um, so honored to be here 
Um, greetings to everyone. Um, women have made great headways um, in the past 20 years in both public and private sectors. So, and you think broadly, women comprised 22% of the work, entire workforce in Afghanistan before August 12, August 15, sorry. Uh, in the public sector, women were 27% of the 400,000 civil servants that we had, and 38% of, um, uh, of teachers in Afghanistan were women. In the private sector, again, there were progress, great progress that were made. Women established the Afghan Women Chamber of Commerce, and according to the, their data, there were over 3,000 licensed small and medium businesses and over 54,000 unlicensed businesses. So we're talking of a huge um, accomplishment and contribution, earning income and contributing to the well-being of themselves and of their families and society, which also impacted on the development indicators at the, at the end. But the Political and economic turmoil of August 15 took a big toll on women in all aspects. There were reports specifically referring to a World Bank report that came a few months before. There were 75% reduction in women employment. And of all the businesses that were established, many of them closed down because they couldn't survive the turmoil, both economically and political uncertainty and, and everything. The annual per capita income is expected to even um, decrease by half compared to 2012, which will have its impact on women because at the end, we all know the last penny is spent on women in any household. Um, many of the expertise industries, for example, carpet weaving and others were closed because exports were limited. Now, many of us, or as I have heard, argue that situation has been better in rural areas because there is relative security. The survey that I saw a few days ago, the situation is not much change in rural areas too. The survey showed that more women's mobility is decreasing. Their access to outside their neighborhood um, is decreasing. And because aid is being distributed to where they cannot go, even the access, uh, of their access to aid is, is much worse than access of Maine to the aid that is being distributed right now. So short term, we are talking about um, extracting economic contribution of women's workforce that were there before August 15. And again, because I'm an economist to re referring a report that there is a loss of 5% of GDP, which is close to $1 billion according to UN report. Long-term impact, if you're extracting um, contribution of the half of the human capital of the country, it means you're losing employability, you're losing access and economic contribution of half of the population of, of Afghanistan. And that, is, that starts from their access of, and banning um, of women to education and their ability to go and provide their skills on the job and um, in many other areas. Um, so I'll stop it here. Thank you. I, you know, I just came back last night from the Tashkent International Conference on Afghanistan, and uh, Special Representative Tom West and I both noted these type of specific figures in terms of what the Taliban are doing and des not only depriving Afghan women of the right to education and work, but decimating the Afghan economy in a country that is struggling so at, at every level. Uh, and what I was encouraged is that many uh, regional actors uh, picked up on this and also cited that the not only just on education, but women's right to work and country, to, uh, ability to contribute to the economy was essential. So that was encouraging. Um, Palwasha John, I want to come back to you. Um, you've long, uh, you, I think you guys have already raised this issue of uh, appealing for direct funding for Afghan women-led civil society organizations. Many of you, of you have noted that it is more, most urgent than ever. In fact, some Afghan women have told me that it's not just the Taliban that's hurting women right now. It's the fact that donor funding has dried up 
and have left Afghan women in a very desperate situation, particularly those that are trying to contribute to the uh, economy and to put food on the table. But one of the challenges that we face and other donors that I've spoken to um, confront is that because they no longer have a presence on the ground, um, there's the, the lack of capacity to monitor and to administer um, those the grants in a way where more could be done uh, with women directly, um, uh, direct funding to women's organizations. And hence, there's a reliance on working with UN organizations and other large organizations. What are some ways to address that? Uh, what else do you want the US government to understand about what women, how to work with women leaders and, and what how to overcome some of those challenges. Uh, thank you. I think um, uh, two points are important. One, uh, uh, it's important for US and international community to remember about compatibility of uh, um, uh, role of international organizations, uh, UN, and uh, also local organization. Um, uh, there is a competition and, uh, um, for resources and funding. I think uh, more partnerships should be encouraged through uh, whatever uh, funding opportunity exists there. Uh, there is role for international organization, and there is role for local organization to be a direct implementer. As you said, uh, we previously raised that the local women organization are very much important for the whole thing as an agency of women uh, lies there um, uh, to foster and to play that role that they need to play. And this can only happen if there is more investment on uh, uh, those organizations which are on the ground, and that could be done directly. I think the international organization can play uh, the role of monitoring, evaluations, and uh, even capacity building, um, uh, and that can create a very good partnership between the two. Um, uh, uh, in uh, conclusion, I would also uh, remind uh, us all that Afghan uh, women leaders uh, are so much scattered uh, outside Afghanistan and maybe inside Afghanistan, and it's very much important uh, that um, many of these women in these um, countries' capitals outside Afghanistan are still struggling for their status, and uh, uh, um, they are not able to participate in an important meeting such as Uzbekistan meeting and others, even if they don't participate in formal meeting for civil society, it's always important that they be part of the parlor uh, uh, events and uh, uh, where they can express themselves, mobilize, and work with other women. And, and, and this lies on support that they need uh, uh, should be given so that they can easily travel and be able to um, uh, combine their efforts for change in the country. So our, our um our part, a panelist uh, from Afghanistan had written in that CDCs might be uh, a, 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 an option in terms of putting more direct funding uh, to women and men. I uh, just wanted to, to get your thoughts on that. That's very important institution. I think uh, CDCs, there have been a lot of uh, efforts for years uh, to mobilize those groups and, um, uh, and it is national level. Uh, I think that is one big, um, let's say, an institution that needs to be revived uh, through direct support to them, but also scattered uh, women groups uh, who are making possible from very scratch and from nothing, not only to deliver services. Right now, if you see in Paktia, Paktika, Khos, and those places which have been affected by earthquake, women have reached there, not only to take services to those places, but also they try to engage with local uh, Taliban there and to ensure that they uh, advocate for the girls and education that and other um, uh, outreach that women need uh, or accessibility that women need, they are uh, advocating on their behalf. So I would say both uh, uh, institution like CDC or uh, community-based uh, councils of women and also women groups, uh, uh, which is more like CSOs, NGOs. Okay, I, I'm gonna cut my questions short because I understand that the secretary is, um, yes, okay. Um, so. Uh, Nay John, I'm going to turn to you now. How can the international community support Afghanistan's long-term economic recovery in a way that preserves women's rights and progress? And if, if you could keep your answers short but specific. 
Yeah, just shortly, political, social, and economic empowerment go hand in hand. Um, so you can't expect economic empowerment without fixing the political and social part of it. But still, our hope is that if you, there's consistent economic empowerment and support, women will gain the ground and stand on their feet. So quick few things. Continue engaging with women on the ground through a specialized agency. Me talking here might be very beneficial, but you can't delete the voice of women who are on the ground and doing it. Second, again, repeating, engage through CDC's community development councils. What women need right now, short term, is access to finance and cash. Cash distribution could be a way to uplift them from the current poverty level quickly. Second, a balance between development and humanitarian. Um, it might sound a little bit um, um, heavy, but I would really like to encourage exports that is um, women produced, even there are, could be creative ways of doing this. If you're sitting face to face with Taliban and not sanctioning them, let's not sanction women exports to them. Um, and last thing, I really want to see women in the eight architecture in Afghanistan and any forums that are being established. I want them to um, have their voice in whatever is being delivered on the ground. Thank you. Thank you. This is, I think, a question from the audience. Uh, what, do you, uh, what role, and I think any, I invite any of you to answer this because I think it's a really important one. What role do you see for digital and social media to play in giving a voice for women? And how, I'm gonna add my own question because I, I think about this a lot. How do you still protect the security of those that are using the, these platforms? Any one of you can take that. Uh, I think the role of um, uh, social or um, uh, digital media is very much important, uh, especially when the uh, formal media is censored in Afghanistan. That is the only outlet that uh, um, regularly reporting on the situation on the ground, and women are effectively using that. Uh, Sometimes maybe not that much effective, uh, uh, because uh, like maybe most post-conflict countries, uh, there are uh, internal um, bitterness and issues uh, that is from time to time uh, reflected in social media. But generally, on, in terms of reporting, uh, speaking on the wants, what people have, especially speaking for the communities or reflecting their pictures. I was so thrilled by seeing pictures, uh, the way communities, um, uh, civil society, um, uh, traditional civil society has been supported in girls' education, those are big news which is coming through social media. Um, protection, I think that's important, and I, um, uh, uh, there are many times that there have been threats in the uh, previously, and now uh, I, I believe we need more training for women to use this more effectively and also more securely so that um, uh, further threat is not posed to them. And those who are outside Afghanistan to ensure that they don't uh, reproduce or uh, share information without consulting the original source of information because sometimes it has been uh, not very safe for uh, some women or men inside the country. Thank you. I have a question that came in online. Um, some argue that the international community's uh, engagement with the Taliban hasn't produced meaningful outcomes for Afghan women and at-risk populations. Should this consultative mechanism and the Special Envoy's Office continue to make efforts to ensure that Taliban respect human rights in the country? Are you hopeful that the Taliban will change their approach to women's rights and human rights in the country. Asila Jan, do you want to take that? Um, I think it's very much important to have meaningful participation from the beginning because um, I have been involved in, in more than two decades to different political um, process from Bonn Conference up to peace process up to Doha and in every um, process. But unfortunately, what I'm seeing is all these repeat that 
they, they, they are using, they, they used Afghan women as a token, as a window dressing, as a kind of like superficial way that not meaningful, uh, we were not meaningful involved. And then you can see the, the result uh, today. But uh, also one thing about um, the human rights atrocity that you mentioned, it's also important for the USG for this, through this mechanism, not only to focus on the documentation and monitoring uh, mechanism in Afghanistan, but there should be a system and mechanism to address um, all these uh, issues uh, that uh, monitoring is very much important, documentation is important, but those issues should be uh, tackled in, or addressed in an effective uh, way. What, what would be the, the, specific, the, the additional mechanism that you would want? Given the context, I want us to bear in mind the context in which the Taliban are the reality, unfortunately, on the ground. They're not listening very much to the international community. We have a special representative West, myself, members of the international community. I think the one issue that everyone has taken up in particular is women's rights to education. And certainly the issue of religious and ethnic minority um, communities is something that we constantly raise. There hasn't been much movement on their end. Um, so in terms of, uh, this is a question that I want to pose to you because you know, I engage, um, uh, and Tom West also engages um, Special Rapporteur Richard Bennett. We're constantly trying to think of how we can do better and pushing more effectively to prevent further violations. Mm -hmm. I think people are, as you say, that saying that the Taliban are uh, the, the, the realities of the country. But Taliban are the reality, but not the only one reality. The reality of Afghanistan is the, the youth of Afghanistan, the women of Afghanistan, the civil society of Afghanistan, the, the, those that they are at the front line, that they are fighting towards terrorism, they are the realities of uh, Afghanistan, not only Taliban. Everybody should be equal to treat it in, in, in all processes. Um, and, and women also. We, we women, we have one woman, we are at the front line. Um, I mean, we, we are at the, at the war with, with Taliban. We, we have one woman and girls, we are erased from the society, politically and socially and economically. We lost our job, there is no school, there is no means of, of living. So we, we, we are the reality of the, the country. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, another question, so I have time for one more question, and this is coming from the floor. What advice would you give to international peace builders and activists that want to support and advocate for Afghan women? May I? Yeah. Uh, can you both can, but go ahead. But quick, uh, quick please. Uh, I think. I'm sorry, I, I don't think I got the question very so, right. What advice would you give to international peace builders and activists that want to more effectively support and advocate for Afghan women? I think it's very much important that international um, uh, friends and community don't speak for Afghans or don't raise their issues. Help Afghan themselves to be part of uh, their own solution. Uh, I think that is the biggest piece of advice I would give and, and give them opportunity to, uh, to design their own solution. Um, uh, I know it's challenging in Afghanistan. Engaging with Taliban is enormously difficult, and uh, also it didn't uh, uh, give the outcome we were expecting. But uh, I think, despite of that, you see that Afghans uh, are uh, tireless, tirelessly uh, putting their efforts to make that change possible, uh, to ensure that peace comes in some way to the country, and uh, uh, those solution needs or those efforts needs to be recognized, supported, and built on. Thank you very much. I, uh, we can do, okay, good. We have time for uh, another question. I'm gonna take this from those that have come in uh, online. Maybe I'll, I'll take an opportunity also to ad address, because part of the question was, the Special Envoy's office, um, even though as a moderator I'm trying to keep myself out. But in terms of engagement with the Taliban, I, I, I continue to maintain that engagement with the Taliban is necessary, particularly to address the situation of uh, Afghans inside the country that are facing a desperate situation. And I really uh, commend, particularly I see uh, Special Representative Tom West, who has a very un unviable role 
Um, and the work that he's doing to try to advance economic stabilization is absolutely critical. On the issue of women's rights and human rights, as you know, I have chosen not to engage the Taliban um, in the last two meetings. The last one was much more on economic stabilization, but the, prior to that, and that was, but I am choosing that at every occasion when it present, when that opportunity is there, I do deliberate the extent to which it is maybe possible for me to just move the needle and even uh, a little bit, then I think it's warranted to sit down with the Taliban. But when I don't hear anything to, to that end that, um, uh, that, that gives me any type of encouragement that sitting down with them uh, I, uh, is going to be helpful. I don't want to give them the space to uh, give some sort of, uh, um, to present to the world that they're engaging in good faith on these issues. So that's a question that's been posed to me and that's a, a deliberative process for me. Thank you, and I think, uh, oh good, I have another one. I'm, I'm constantly <laughs> trying to, I have a great timekeeper up there. Um, so let's go back to another question uh, um, about, um, what are the priorities of Afghan women and people inside the country? What are you hearing from Afghan women uh, as to what, how the consultative mechanism can address their situation? How are you connecting to ensure that those voices are present at the consultative mechanism? Um, there's a part of that that I'm going to answer, but um, I'm going to turn to our colleagues who are each working on a daily basis engaging Afghans inside the country. So I'll turn to all of you in terms of also how you hope to do this. Um, poverty is an, it's heightened and um, economic uh, uh, situation is at the worst uh, right now in Afghanistan. Uh, so uh, despite of a huge concern for human rights, uh, uh, for um, freedom of expression, so many things that women uh, and men in Afghanistan are concerned, they're also concerned how to feed their children. And uh, that is putting their situation in, even in a worse place uh, because a lot of, there is a big rise on um, uh, child marriage, for instance, and other very negative coping mechanism because there is no alternative for the people. And that's huge, that they need support, uh, not as a charity, but uh, uh, a way that enable them uh, uh, that this uh, poverty and economic decline uh, doesn't uh, sustain in the way it is uh, for years. Uh, so they need uh, su support uh, that help them to come out of uh, the current um, sort of tragic and uh, very crisis uh, uh, economic downfall. Thank you. A quick. Uh, uh, thank you. I think she covered everything about the humanitarian assistance and the human rights. I just heard yesterday that Zebulon Mujahid announced that uh, we are going to uh, contribute or to pay salaries to women beggars. But why you are not paying? Why you are paying salary? Why you are not creating a source, a meaningful source to to to, to work and then to create a job opportunity for those women to work? It's not sustainable that you are paying salaries to uh, women beggars. So women are facing lots of challenges, as, as she said, from human uh, humanitarian uh, assistance that they are not part. But one thing, at, uh, because you're in Hari, I know that uh, I would just like to mention about the coordination among the donors is also very much important. And also coordination among the different platforms, like uh, I have been personally involved with UN agencies, with uh, EU, with OIC, and then they are just listening to us. They are just, they want to listen up. Everybody knows what's the problem. But unfortunately, there is no one inch uh, differences in, like in, in movement of Taliban, they are not changing. Um, what, what, what they, they were stuck from the beginning, but we would like to see some some changes also. And then U.S. government through this mechanism, they should pressurize Taliban. They have the leverage, the financial leverage, the political leverage, um, the economic leverage. So they have to. Uh, pressurize a little bit Taliban in terms of women's movement, girls' education, protection of civil society organization, these things. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so I think, um, I know that there are questions in the audience. I'm sorry we don't have more time. Um, the secretary is here, so I just, uh, want to turn to him because he has an incredibly busy schedule, so I'm quite grateful that he's here. It's a testament to how committed he is to this issue that he has, uh, he has managed to make it uh, to our event today. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, let me say it is always a particular pleasure to visit our neighbors at the uh, U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, Lise, thank you so much for, uh, for hosting us. Uh, wonderful to be here. Um, and Rena, to you, to our special envoy, to the team working with you, to the many others who were involved uh, with today's launch, um, I'm grateful for all you've done to bring all of us together today, uh, but for the work that's being done every day that I'll have a chance to talk about uh, over the next few minutes. But um, to our colleagues across the entire U.S. government, uh, civil society, thank you as well for supporting equality, supporting opportunity for women and girls across Afghanistan. And a special thanks to the extraordinary panelists that we've had uh, today. I'm really looking forward to getting a chance to speak with uh, you directly shortly. But as you all know, they've served in Afghanistan in different ways, uh, from different roles. But there is one thread that runs throughout their public service. Each, each has helped to strengthen the rights of Afghan women and girls, as well as members of other vulnerable groups for decades. Today, they represent many others across Afghanistan and around the world who've dedicated their lives to this deeply vital and deeply honorable mission. As the panelists made clear, we meet at a difficult time for Afghan women and girls. Um, since the Taliban took over a year ago, they've reversed a great deal of the openness and progress that had been made over the previous decades. They've silenced civil society and journalists. In March, they banned independent international media, like Voice of America and BBC, from airing in Afghanistan. They continue to intimidate and censor Afghan media outlets. They've stifled the free practice of religion for Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Perhaps most notably, they failed to respect the human rights of women and girls. Instead, under the Taliban, women and girls have largely been erased from public life. As a report released yesterday by Amnesty International showed, the Taliban have systematically restricted women and girls' rights to free movement, decimated the system supporting domestic violence victims, and contributed to surging rates of child, early, and forced marriage. The Taliban's decision to ban girls from attending secondary schools, a decision that happened while some girls were literally walking to school and others were already sitting at their desks, was a reversal of commitments they made to the Afghan people and to the world. For 314 days and counting, the girls of Afghanistan have sat at home while their brothers and cousins have been receiving educations. It's a terrible terrible waste. It's especially difficult to accept because we all remember how different it was not so very long ago. Prior to the Taliban's takeover, thousands of women across Afghanistan held public office from the village level right up to the national level. Women entered professions previously closed to them. They started businesses. They were doctors, nurses, scientists, artists. And women didn't just study at schools across Afghanistan, they ran them. These gains weren't felt only by women and girls. As we've seen again and again throughout history, from country to country, when equality and opportunity increase for one group of people, they tend to increase for other groups as well. As the rights of women and girls in Afghanistan were strengthened, we saw members of various ethnic and religious communities, Hazaras, Hindus, Sikhs, Sufis, take more prominent roles in Afghan public life. Afghans with disabilities did as well. The LGBTQI plus community found ways to build a community. So the changes in Afghanistan during the past year have been painful for so many. We continue to urge the Taliban to reverse their decision on girls' education, to make good on their commitment to the Afghan people, to allow girls to learn. The evidence is overwhelming. Investing in girls' education, uh, women's political inclusion, it leads to stronger economies. It leads to healthier individuals and families. It leads to more stable, more resilient societies. These are the things the people of, Af of Afghanistan want for their futures. That's why so many members of Afghan society, men and women, 
rural and urban dwellers, religious scholars, people across religions and cultural backgrounds have all, all called for the Taliban to let women and girls go to school again. The United States will continue to amplify these voices and do all that we can to support progress for Afghan women, girls, and other at-risk populations. Uh, earlier this year, we joined partners across the international community, including the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, Qatar, Turkey, Pakistan, the European Union, and others, urging the Taliban to let girls go back to school. Last month, we supported a Human Rights Council urgent debate that allowed us to hear directly from Afghan women uh, leaders. We co-sponsored a resolution that will allow us to hear from them again this coming September. And as we help enable their voices to be heard, others will hear them as well. Over the past year, we've continued our partnerships with Afghan civil society groups, uh, working on issues of equality, inclusion, opportunity for women, religious and ethnic communities, and other at-risk populations. Uh, and critically, with today's launch of the U.S.-Afghan consultative mechanism, we are taking these relationships to the next level. That's why I'm so pleased about today. Um, it's going to make it easier for Afghan civil society groups to communicate and collaborate with American policymakers across a whole range of shared priorities, from supporting income-generating activities for Afghan women to strategizing ways to help Afghan human rights monitors safely document abuses to devising new methods to promote religious freedom. What we want to do is to make our partnerships with Afghan civil society more effective, more rigorous, more productive, more purposeful. And that's what this new initiative is all about. So let me simply share my profound appreciation for our American civil society partners who do critical work to support women leaders and civil society organizations in Afghanistan and for our Afghan partners for sharing your perspectives, for sharing your recommendations. What's remarkable to me, and I think to so many of us, is how even in the face of threats, violence, intimidation, the women and girls of Afghanistan and other vulnerable targeted people have simply refused to back down. These groups have never stopped believing in a brighter future for their country. They're determined to do all they can to make that future real. The women who've taken to the streets to protest for their rights are one such group. In December, when members of the Afghan National Security Forces were targeted despite the Taliban's supposed amnesty, women protested. In January, when female public servants were dismissed from their jobs, women protested. In March, when the Taliban instituted an edict directing women to cover their faces in public and to only leave home when, quote, necessary, women protested. Many of them said that they will never, never stop raising their voices. The work we've done here today will ensure that we and people around the world continue to hear them, continue to listen to them as we work together for a more stable, peaceful, prosperous, and free future for Afghanistan and for every Afghan man and woman. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us today.